Well, Gary, first of all, I think the obvious question is, how do you feel today? I mean, 40 years is a hell of a long time, but it, it seems like yesterday when we see all of the footage that the club are putting out, etc. this morning, it takes you back so quickly. It's absolutely crazy. I mean, 40 years, where does 40 years go? And the, the good thing about it, we're all still here to tell the, to uh, the, the story. You know, we're all still here and uh, smiles on our faces when we can, different circumstances. But yeah, it's just, it, it's still surreal a little bit because in 1976, I was a floor layer. I was working on building sites. And four years later, you know, they, well, it, it's just incredible the story in those four years when I, from getting in the team and finishing that European um, run in 1980, it's just staggering to think about how, how it happened. It's mad, isn't it? Because I think the first, the first recollection I had of you as a player was in the first European Cup run when you scored the goal at the city ground against Liverpool. That was kind of where it, it took off. So I think the, despite the fact you've, you've won it twice as a player, it must hold a special place in your heart because it was such a launching pad for you as a top-flight footballer. Well, look, I, I feel so privileged and lucky to have played with that team under that manager and to be part of the celebrations and the history of it all. It's unbelievable because I'm you know, a local lad from Chilwell. And like I say, I, I got turned down by Aston Villa when I was 15. Had to go and find a job, went down to the job centre, Dad was a floor layer, saw a job for a floor layer, £12 a week, went and got that. And then, you know, worked on building sites when winters were winters, as they used to say. And, you know, to get the opportunity to then change from that and playing at that level was just incredible. And, uh, you know, it, it all rings home when you look at Jose Mourinho. When he, he wrote the forward for, I, I believe, in Miracles. And apparently he came up to Nottingham without anybody knowing incognito to see how a city as small as Nottingham could win back-to-back -back European Cups and that speaks volumes for me that he actually did that to find out and was so surprised that the city was so small you can walk across it you know Fletch you can walk across it in 15 minutes we've staggered across it many times uh, together <laughs> in the past uh, to, to you know different areas so you know for a little t town like Nottingham it's just Suness you know, when he said about Larry Lloyd's comments, Larry said, I think it's the greatest um, achievement in football. And Graham Sooner said, yeah, I think Larry's right. And for somebody like him to say that, you know, you listen. I remember when you, you won it for the first time in, in, in 1979. Um, I, was, I was set to celebrate my eighth birthday that October. So I was kind of seven and a half watching it. And then when you won it for the second time, I was obviously eight and a half. And my, my thought as a young fan in Nottingham at that time was, well, this is what they do. They win the European Cup. They're the best team, best club side in the world. That's just what they are. And, and then I gradually realised as I got older just what, a, what an achievement it was. But as a youngster back then, that was just kind of what you did. You know, that, that was, you were the best team and that was that. Fletch, you've always reached for the top, you haven't you? So <laughs> you know, those young years, you were, you were actually saying, well, they should be winning the European Cups even then. But you're right. The you know, one annoying thing about the two Cups is people say, well, they only beat Malmo, they only beat Hamburg. But you look at Malmo's run to the final and you look at the semi-final of Hamburg, they lost the first leg 2-0 to Real Madrid and then absolutely battered them 5-1 in the second leg. So that shows how good they were. You know, and you look at the team, the setup of the team, they have some fabulous players. Then the, the Ajax semi-final as well. You look at that team, they were one of the best teams in Europe at that point. So, you know, you can take nothing away from that, but sometimes people try. When you think back to the second final, because obviously it's the anniversary of that, it was your layoff for John's goal. Um, is that memory still absolutely etched in your mind? Is that still absolutely vivid for you, the role that you played and, and that moment in the game? Robbo reminds me of it all the time. You know, he said, well, you did really well there, Baz. Um, but yeah, I, I can remember the guy who kicked me to the floor, Bullian. He was a big, big unit. And he tried to do that all evening, try to whack me. And after 10 minutes, it was my job to try and stem the tide coming towards us because Gary Mills dropped back in, in midfield. But I remember with Robbo, with the ball at his feet, I always used to go towards him, never away from him. You know, because I know if, 
if I if I went towards him, he'd give him he'd give me the ball, and he did. He gave me the ball. Didn't stop. He wanted it back, and he he was on his favourite right foot. People forget that he was a left winger, right footed. So we had no problem when he just checked inside on his right foot. People must have been thinking, well, that was a bit lucky because he's left left winger, right foot, but he drilled it beautifully. And uh, yeah, we we still talk about it now. And uh, yeah, it's just it's surreal. Forty years. Where are forty years gone? <laughs> Yeah, no. Also, I think one thing that's really significant, but that's probably because I'm a, a football anorak, is that is that Brian was 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 four four two. That's the way he played football. Two wide players. He loved the winger. Forwards had to do a certain job. Central defenders had roles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that was one of the extremely rare occasions where tactically he did something different, didn't he? Against. Um, Hamburg in the second final because he essentially played with five in midfield which was something he never did well he, we never started out we never even mentioned the fact that we could go um, four, uh, four five one never mentioned it at all but after 10 minutes they were that good they were battering us that much and we lost Trevor and Millsy had come in so people talk about four five one now you know he did it then on the spur of the moment 10 minutes into a European Cup final him and Pete must have sat there because they were sat away from everybody else at first and they must have just chatted over and said, right, we've got to change things here. How many managers now or coaches would you see do that? They all do it by the book now. Substitutes are made unless there are injuries on the hour mark. You know, it's all very predictable now what, what happens. But they were totally unpredictable. And thank goodness they were because if we'd have stayed 4-4-2, we wouldn't be having this conversation now. It was mad, wasn't it? Because they were perceived as being the favourites going in, but of course you were the defending champions and you weren't losing many games in whatever competition you played at that time. What did that feel like as the defending champions going into the final where the majority of people thought you, you, you may well be biting off a little bit more than you could chew? Well, it, 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 it preys on your mind a little bit, but then you get the reassurance from the gaffer, you know, you're better than them. They're favourites. I mean, that was my 136th game in two seasons, that final including the, like the, you know, the County Cup against Knotts and Mansfield, all the pre-season friendlies. Uh, we went to Bahrain and Abu Dhabi. You know, Cluffy used to take us all over the world for games because we were European champions. And I counted them up and the whole lot. And he never treated a friendly like a friendly. It was always you playing against Liverpool. So it was my 136th game. And I was just absolutely shattered. And that, the benefit of going to Callum Law in the build-up to the game, I think was pivotal and beneficial so much for how we performed in that game. If we'd not done that and relaxed and just chilled out, had drink, tennis or whatever, sunbathe, I think we'd have got beat. I think that was so important that he got us away from all the hype, you know, the journalists, family, people wanting tickets. It just did the job for us, prepared us brilliantly. And I think that was a big part in us winning it. Give me that categorically, because we've heard, I, I always think the brilliant, the brilliant thing about any Brian Clough story is that you can kind of make it as big or small as you want to, because there was so much realism involved in all of these things that seem so bizarre to everybody else, and they always were. Just how much did you do in terms of, on, on, a, on a, a percentage basis, relaxation compared to preparation between going to Calamore and kicking off in Madrid for the final? Purely, purely relaxation. Purely? I yeah, I, somebody moaned about, uh, we've not, we've not uh, done any training, and he got a rollicking for it. I don't know who it was still. It might have been the, the captain. Might I, think it was, I think it was Burnsy, you know. I think Burnsy's told me the story that he'd said to the manager, Burnsy, do you Burnsy not think we should be... Yeah. Well, that's, what <laughs> that's what he claims. That's what he claims. I'm not having that's that. That's what he claims. <laughs> <laughs> that's that. what he claims. And he said that... that, that, that that Brian said to him, Kenneth, you're right. And then they, then you, you did something off the back not of Not much. That was his Not version. very much. Not, not very much. much at all. No, no, not at all. I can't even remember running or doing any training, that preparation. I can remember relaxing with a pint, you know, because he, there was no curfew, nothing like that. I remember having a game of tennis, I think, with Ian Bowie. You're not a full, you know, blooded thing, but a knock-up. Um, so, yeah, it was just relaxation, lying in the sun. You know, if you did that now and said to a, a coach now or players now, that's what we're going to do, there'd be looks of disbelief on their faces and they would, it wouldn't happen. It doesn't happen. Um, it's just very professional, 
but because we played that many games and they came you know thick and fast because we were successful then it was the perfect point yeah it was fantastic you know imagine before a week before a european cup final you're taken away to the sunshine you're allowed to drink you you know not ridiculously and you're allowed to sunbathe it lifts you as a player you're thinking right this is brilliant right i'm refreshed now i am going to give everything i possibly can to this match and that's how it works you know the whole team was absolutely brilliant and that's what the great liverpool players say they couldn't beat us for two years because they couldn't move us around they couldn't break us down and that they they could break anybody down and that's what they all say yeah and and, and one thing i wish we'd had back then when, when when we we have the technology now and i sit in the commentary position doing the champions league final and i've got a screen in front of me and I know everything that every player is doing, how many passes they've completed, how many kilometres they've run. There's everything there. I would love to know how far you ran that night. I can't ever remember seeing you with your socks around your ankles other I'm than, never. right, that final in Madrid. And you never, you literally never stopped going across that line and, and putting that unselfish shift in to make sure that everything else could function. Do you know how far you went that night? And how did you feel at the end of it? I don't, but I'll tell you the, the story of it. I, I, you're right, you're spot on. I've never, ever played with my socks down. I always think it looks scruffy. But I was that tired, and that was my job. I had to close people down. You know, I, I love running. I love work rate. I was good at it. And I knew that I had to try and stop people just coming out too easily, because if I didn't, then we would be under pressure for a long time. But everybody played the part that time. And the, the, what the gaffer said to me afterwards... He said, you ran more miles than Emil Zatopek in the, 50, the 1952 Helsinki Olympics because Zatopek won the 5,000, the 10,000 gold, and then decided for the first time in his life he was going to run the marathon, and he won that as well. So on that basis, <laughs> he, he said, you ran more miles than Emil Zatopek. And remember, at the end of the game, I remember thinking, well, where, you know, where are we going to get the, the medals from if we win this? It's usually up in the stand. But it wasn't. It was two old guys with a little trestle table on the side of the pitch. And the, the whistle went for the, what we thought was the end. And they yes. started marching on with the table. They came on with the table. The referee went, no, no. Yeah. It was off side. And we yeah, thought, oh, off the no. End. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, no, how many more minutes left? But luckily, it was probably a minute. And yeah, but that's how it was. That's how bizarre the whole uh, experience was. And I mean, you know, we, we're kind of look, looking back on it today and we're celebrating, but it's something that never, ever leaves the mind of a, of a Nottingham Forest supporter. There are so many iconic situations associated with that period. I mean, I think even down to the, to, to the strip. I mean, I think if I could have one thing for next season that I'd do, that I could associate with, with Forest, it would be to have a complete replica of that kit with the old Adidas badge and all the writing around this side and, and the three stripes and the V-neck, because I think that's the best football kit ever made. Well, you're a Forest fan, Fletch. You would think that. But, and I know what you mean. A lot of people are like that. You know, to be fair, since then, you know, the, the story has changed. The club went through bad periods. Uh, we're still in the championship. And people look back at the last significant period of real success at any football club. And that is it. That's major. That's the second one to the World Cup. You know, the World Cup's a major one, and then that, that is the next. And to win it back to back, and we're still the only side to win it twice without winning our actual league twice. You know, so that speaks volumes as well. We would have said after the first one, and anybody would have thought, uh, you ask every Forest fan, right, oh, that's brilliant. We've won a European Cup. We're, we're delighted with that now. Never expected it. Should never have happened without the genius of Clough and Taylor. It did. But then we went on and won it again. You know, and that is just staggering, you know. And then it really annoys me, the, they say the Leicester story, you know, winning the Premier League is, is you know, out. Isn't, you know, Not a made, chance. You Not know, a look, chance. Look when Brian Clough came into the club and what happened. Five players were there who went on to win those two European Cups. But there was a Super Cup, there was two League Cups. There was a, you know, they won the Premier League after finishing third in what was the championship. Following season, they go and win the Premier League. Come on. You know, what, the, what he achieved for the city of Nottingham, not, not just as, as footballers, it put Nottingham on the map. You used to go on holiday and people say, where are you from? Or Nottingham, oh, Robin Hood. 
you know, and then Torval and Dean. But then when we won, oh, Nottingham Forest, Brian Clough. You know, it did a, an amazing amount for the city. And it still does, I think. It still resonates because we're all there and we've got that record still of being, as I say, the only one to win it twice without winning our league twice. So it's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I, 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 I should know, having spent so much time around people like you and around this game, that you never take anything for granted and you never say never. But I think I can confidently say that in my lifetime and probably in my children's lifetime, they will never see the like of this again. Forrest will never win back-to-back European Cups again because it just won't happen in that way ever again. You were part of something extremely special. And it's a real privilege, mate, to sit down with you today and reminisce for 10 minutes because I know that's what all the Forest fans are doing today. So from the Forest nation, really, I think we would all say to you today and everybody else, thank you so much for the memories. You've given so much to everybody. And I hope you raise a glass at some point today and toast yourself and your teammates and the management team and just enjoy today for what it is because you, you thoroughly deserve it. Well, I hope all the other lads are doing the same. I mean, thanks, thanks for that. I mean, you're right. We never, ever accepted what we'd done, I don't think, you know, because everybody was, you know, quite humble. Nobody craved the publicity or the stardom of it all. And it just all came back through, I believe, in miracles, you know, the Johnny Owen film. And that put us back on the, uh, on the map. And, you know, people stood up and talked about it, took notice of it. I was supposed to be doing a plate piece for Sky this morning, but because everybody's working from home, the, the internet was crazy about 10 past, 20 past nine. So I couldn't get all, you know, what I wanted to out there. But I think they did a reasonable job of explaining how special it was. Um, and it's nice to see that, that, you know, there is a understanding that what we achieved despite who we beat in the finals is just incredible for the size of a town if you look at the size of all the other towns you know they're massive and one thing a German sports writer said I can remember years ago he said by far the best team ever to win the European Cup are Nottingham Forest because of the speed it happened where they came from the size of the town and those things resonate with you and thinking well if people like that are saying that that, that's good. Perfect way to finish. Enjoy the rest of your day. Andrew, Paul, nice to see you. Thanks, mate.